Hi and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode 65 and today we're going to talk about the ultimate one draft data. There's not going to be any more data. We have one day of data and that's it. We're going to know everything about the format. It's practically solved. Um, so um, that's probably the last seminar about uh, one data that we're going to make um, until the next set is getting released. I'm of course kidding uh, and trying to be ironic about people who draw too much from uh, the first day of data or even from before the first day of data. But before we go into my rants and complaints, um, this podcast is sponsored by mtgazone.com. Uh, I restarted my writing career in there. Um, so uh, please go click on my articles. The more clicks they get, the more likely they are going to prolong our uh, sponsorship deal. So uh, yeah. And while you're there, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you can find something that you enjoy yourself, uh, whether it be uh, constructed articles from PV or uh, limited articles from uh, J2S Josh or something else because you your jam is historic pro. You, you're going to find it. There's all the deck lists. I very often just go there and blatantly net deck if I have to fulfill some kind of a uh, quest or something. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, go on and check them out. Right. Let's go to the topic. But of course, before we go into the topic, I always do my preamble. And today's preamble is that formats take time to develop. And first day of one was particularly vicious on being critical about it, on telling that the format is like this and that, that that's what it is. That's why my title of the presentation was such an ironic take on that. Uh, formats do take time to develop for several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons, in the first days, people pick cards uh, suboptimally. That means that certain decks become uh, very open and uh, actually can dominate the metagame, uh, but that is not conducive of any future success of those decks. So for example, Midnight Hunt, uh, blue-black was wide open for the first couple of weeks because people didn't know which cards to draft. Uh, some very key cards for blue-black were going atrociously late, and those who are in the know can abuse that kind of system and uh, win a lot of games using that particular deck because, you know, if every draft you're guaranteed that you're going to get 30, 35 good cards for a particular archetype, yeah, you're going to be fine. Um, over time, those decks get more contested and because they get more contested, you don't have access to all the goodies and you have to actually start thinking about your lanes. Um, second reason is that some decks are just easier to build than the others. And usually it's been aggro that was uh, dominant in the first weeks because Aggro decks, simple, you put creatures, tricks, removal, and that's it. Synergy kind of decks, uh, they take time to know exactly how many copies of which card do you want, which cards are absolutely necessary for them, uh, and uh, which cards are uh, hot garbage for them. Uh, hopefully, as one progresses, we will be able to actually try to find out using the data which are the good slow decks for, um, for the format, because the format is fast. Uh, we're going to have a whole section uh, dedicated to looking at the speed of that format. Um, and there are other reasons uh, apart from that. Um, we don't know everything. We make mistakes. Builds are suboptimal. And very often when you have suboptimal builds, you get this big disparity between decks that really win and decks that really lose. And I think that this is the main problem of this format so far. And I'm going to hopefully try to explain my rationale behind that thought in the next couple of slides. There we go. Here we have the graph of the speed of uh, one from yesterday. And this graph has been, well, variation of this graph has been shared uh, by multiple people telling, ah, this is the worst format ever. Because uh, if you look at it, on this axis, we have the average game duration in number of turns. Uh, you can see that um, in the last couple of sets, the slowest format was uh, uh, Dominaria United. Uh, roughly, the games finished at 9.7 turns, which is pretty slow for uh, arena standards, even if you look at the historical data. And the fastest format was Midnight Hunt, uh, roughly at 8.8 .8 turns. And here we have the data. This is the uh, best of one draft in uh, one, uh, games last 8.1 turns. That's like markedly, markedly slower than uh, Midnight Hunt. Um, this is Quick Draft, uh, 7.9 turns. That's the same, that's that's faster than the cube, and the cube is really fast. 
despite Q being fast, it's still adored by everyone. And here people say, well, this format this sucks because it's too fast. Um, bit of inconsistency uh, there. I don't think that speed is any kind of uh, predictor of how good the format is. Uh, there are other things in play. Maybe people just want to use speed because they have data on speed and, um, and, and use that data to uh, say that they don't like it because they don't have a better reason. OK, but this is not the only axis on this graph. There is the other one, game, play, game win rate on play. And this is a very important statistic. Um, and this is, I think, something that you can complain much more. Uh, you can see that in Dominaria, there was a roughly 50-50 uh, win rate on play and on the draw, which shows that this format, especially in best of one, it's important that um, you're not completely disadvantaged when you, when you lose the coin flip because you only have one game to play. Um, most formats are around, there is around two percentage points uh, advantage of being on the play. Fair, there is a tempo advantage that you get from being on the play. And we see the data from uh, um, from one when you see 55, 56% win rate on the play. This is a chasm. This is like almost the difference between mulliganing and not mulliganing just by losing and winning the coin flip. And lots of people uh, jumped on this data and looked at it and, uh, and said, oh, well, this format sucks. It's fast and you have such a big advantage of being on the play. However, you have to approach data very carefully when you look at it. And for me, I first uh, looked at it and said, wow, that's pretty impressive, I have to say. But my brain operates in the way that if I see something that is really so impressive, I'm starting to think, that's probably too good to be true. And that's a good habit of uh, looking at very surprising and very shocking data. It's caution and maybe some kind of defensive strategy uh, towards it. That's how basically science works. You have a phenomenal results, or at least should work. Uh, you have a phenomenal result. You look at it and you say, "Ooh, some people that are maybe uh, uh, less, uh, you know, pragmatic about how they uh, approach the science, maybe like a, a, a young uh, uh, researcher, might jump on that result and say, wow, that's amazing. And then they will always meet a bitter old professor who's a veteran of multiple papers that will look at this data and say, right, that looks pretty good. So where was the mistake made in the experimental design? What did we forget to control for? Where is the uh, uh, flaw in the design? And I approach the data from magic similar way. Um, I look at this kind of data and I say, oh, there probably is something wrong with that because that's way off anything else. When you look at it, uh, Midnight Hunt, best of three, uh, was the most imbalanced uh, format of the last couple of uh, years. And it has a 50, 2.7 roughly uh, game win rate on play advantage. Here I look at almost 56. That's 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 just a different universe completely. But then I started looking at the colors of those um, uh, of those uh, markers. And here we have best of one. Here we have sealed, and here we have quick draft. And I looked at it and I said. Quick draft is not out until probably two weeks into the format when they finish with the sealed. So where does this data come from? Where, where do we get the quick draft data? And the only time we had quick draft data was during the early access streams. Uh, I also see that where is the best of three? I mean, I know best of three is less popular than best of one for the right reasons, but uh, people still play it for, for some reason. Um, and it's missing. And that means to me that we have quick draft, which is in the early access streams. We don't have best of three, which is actually absent from the best uh, from the early access streams, which means that this data is exclusively based on early access. And it's really not fair to compare early access streams um, to regular season, because first of all, there is no money on stake because people get free gems and they just play. They just jam a draft, maybe try to force something. It doesn't come together. And then they will, well, whatever, I play three games and then I uh, drop out of the draft. Um, despite it being technically illegal to concede games, uh, people still do concede quite a lot of games in the early access streams. So um, um, that's also going to play into, um, into the game duration and maybe the advantages. You know, you can imagine I open the game 
opponent gets some some kind of advantage early and you're just like yeah i couldn't be bothered i'm just gonna concede this one and start a new one um and all those things don't have to but can have an impact on those data especially when you see something that is such an outlier as as, as these numbers um well, technically illegal, Momin Latte, because obviously people do it, so um, and no one is going to verify it because I highly doubt that there is a wizard employee that is dedicated to watching early access streamers and then going with the yellow card and say, oh, concede it early, maybe, maybe one more concession and you're not going to be reinvited. I don't think that that's happening. Um, so this was the graph earlier yesterday, and then in the evening, uh, the data has been updated and we have a change of the... Uh, uh, of the numbers. Uh, here, unfortunately, stupidly, I also added HBG uh, to the data pool. HBG was the fastest and most imbalanced format in uh, in the last years. But what you can see is that um, this best of one, that was 56% almost uh, advantage uh, on the play uh, in one, moved on to around 50 uh, uh, 52.8, roughly the same level as Midnight Hunt, maybe slightly bigger advantage, but not by much. Um, also, you can see that uh, when here the game length was 8.1 turns, uh, here we have 8.4 in best of one. So that's a change. That's a change that um, shows a certain trend and also proves my earlier suspicion that uh, the original data set was just not comparable with what we have. I'm pretty sure that it's not going to change dramatically, but it will slow down a bit maybe over the time. Maybe this advantage will move into that. I will, after the format, uh, try to make an analysis that will compare that uh, across formats. But of course, across format comparisons are absolutely pain to, to make. So um, I will try to do that, but I don't know if I will have enough resolve and, and, and strength to, uh, to do that. But um, um, my guess it will be moved somewhere to 8.6, maybe, maybe 52.5% win rate on the play, which is still fast and it's still uh, unbalanced compared to, let's say, Bro or, or Dominaria United or even Streets of New Capena, but it's not such an outlier. It's just slightly slower. Um, and then I thought maybe there's other factors at play, so I will decide. I decided to look at some other data. And one data that I personally love to uh, look at is a percent of games that the card is in hand. And I look at every single card in the set. I calculate how many times they were in the hand uh, of the player and how many games were played with those cards. And then I can calculate the numbers. So roughly for the one, uh, each card has been in the hand 40% of the times it's being played. 40%, um, I know it because I analyzed it for other sets. That's low, that's low. Normally, um, you would expect something around 44, 45% of the time that you draw a card when you have it in your deck. So this indicates certain speed, but of course, percentage of the games uh, uh, when a card is in hand, it's conducive to some other things. Uh, it's, not only, um, it's not only the speed of the format, but also the prevalence of card draw. So I think that one has a combination of being slightly faster and also not having as much contripping as other formats do. Um, and I compare them to the last five sets. Um, so the average for one is 40.1%, Bro 44%, DMU 45%, uh, Streets of New Capena 44.2%, and Neo 43.8%. Quite stable actually across all those formats in terms of um, how often do you see cards. And this one is markedly uh, less. So you will see less of your cards. Um, and that means games are shorter, you draw fewer cards in general. Okay. So yes, the complaints that the speed of one is faster are grounded in data. However, maybe the complaints are slightly exaggerated and maybe people are complaining not only about speed, but also lack of the thirdliness that people love to play. Um, uh, um, not enough uh, country thing, and maybe that will change when people find builds that can use those draw three cards. Maybe it will change when people will figure out how to play the defense in the first turns and then overtake. Um, we will see about that. Okay. Um, and one thing 
I wanted to uh, show you is I took all the formats, well, like, except for the weird ones that have probably small sample sizes um, in the history of 17 lands. Um, and the same graph as before, but only for the best of one draft. Uh, there is a pretty good uh, regression, pretty good correlation between the length of the game and the uh, advantage on the play. Uh, this is the cube. Um, these are the actual regular formats. Cube is a big outlier. Uh, you have huge advantage in the cube of being on the play, but allegedly that doesn't bother anyone. Um, what you can see is that for now, in this early data, one is a big outlier in terms of it's fast, but it doesn't give as big an advantage of being on the play as you would expect from being that fast. Being that fast, you would expect it to be somewhere close to the cube, so having around 55% um, uh, game win rate on play. But what you see is just under 53% uh, win rate on play, which is a big difference, actually. Um, what that makes me speculate is that the speed of the games is not because of um, format being particularly fast, but speed is mainly due to the fact that uh, there are some vastly superior decks and some vastly inferior decks. Uh, because that means that even though the format is fast, you still have a good chance of winning when you're on the draw. Um, and that doesn't compute to me that the reason for that would be that the format is fast, 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 um, uh, only, only because of the speed. It means to me that some decks will have just so much superior cards that they will win whether uh, on the play or on the draw. I had a trophy deck already in this format where I played every single game that I played. I was on the draw and I went 7-1 without a problem. And I was ahead in every game. I was not having a problem with um, uh, being on board, uh, getting advantage on board, uh, overcoming the board. It was a black and white deck, so there was no problem for me on triggering Corrupted. And then um, when once I triggered Corrupted, I could take over the game quite easily. And I absolutely felt invincible in playing this deck um, uh, against the opposition that I got. Uh, and I think that it was because I just got the right combination of the early drops, um, uh, board control, and top end uh, that made me just cruise through those games, even if opponent had the first um, say in everything. Right. So this is all that I'm going to talk about speed. We might uh, have some intrusions of the speed while we look at the card data. Um, let's move on to the actual first data and big caveat. This is based on one day. Normally when I do my first data stream, the format is released on Thursday and I do the stream next Thursday. So I have like six days of data, which is quite a lot. Uh, this time, uh, unfortunately, only one day of data. So treat those data with caution. They are preliminary, they are hints. This data from the first day should be not to give you answers, but to let you ask the right questions, if you can think about it like this. Um, and obviously early data is still good. It still points to something, um, but it, it does require a larger sample size. And also it requires a different sample size. So as I said, first days, most people don't know what they are doing. People draft randomly. There is a big chunk of players that only play in the first few days, uh, which models the data. The win rates are slightly higher in those first days uh, because heavily invested players that you know listen to five set reviews um, will have an advantage over people that just, oh, new set, I'll play a couple of drafts, why not? Um, so treat it with caution. And uh, don't uh, deal with absolutes, please. Uh, we definitely want to keep our mind open and we definitely are not going to talk, wow, this card is clearly the best thing um, uh, and this card is clearly unplayable. It's just that we don't know enough. But it's important to look at this early data and it's important to uh, think about what it means. So here we have the best color pairs. Now, I didn't make that graph, but one, looks decisively like a two color format. Um, uh, although some three color decks uh, did pretty well, but of course numbers are super small. Um, so the best archetype so far is Gruel. 
61.3% win rate, that is very high. And that is almost three percentage points higher than Boros, which is second. Um, this is a very key piece of information. Um, and I think that this is a, a piece of information that we can trust um, because we'll see it in the second graph. But uh, um, yeah, for now, we, we can sort of trust that Gruel is a very powerful archetype. Um, I've had someone asking me in a tweet, when will people figure out that green, uh, that Gruel is the best um, color combination? They already did. And despite that, Gruel is still pretty strong. Um, second place is Boros, the red-white um, equipment deck, 58.5. Uh, so yeah, roughly three percentage points, well, three percentage points um, um, uh, lower win rate, but still 58.5 is um, uh, quite a lot. Um, then third is Orzov with 58.4. Um, again, it looks pretty solid. It looks convincingly good. Uh, I think that <laughs> those things will slightly change when evaluations of cards will slightly change. And I will not get like pick one, pack one, pick four um, uh, great cards for Orzov. But I think that Orzov has a pretty much by model distribution of the win rates. Because some people try to try to force it and it doesn't work, but when it works, you're in the money. Um, then we have Selesnya um, uh, with 57.5, so slightly lower than the other two. I think that the Gruel is in the league of its own right now. These are slightly better than the rest. Then we have this some kind of mid 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 of the pack: Selesnya, Simic, Azorius, and Rakdos. Uh, maybe Rakdos slightly behind. And then we have three decks that are uh, markedly behind, and that's Is it Golgari and Dimir? Uh, so uh, Is it 53, Golgari 52.5, Dimir 51.8, while Simic, Azorius, and Ragdos are like 57, 56 and a half, 55 and a half. Then we were talking about those kind of range. Uh, Brett Shear says, I'm skeptical. I believe it's possibly the best, but I suspect uh, not by much. So I'm not 100% sure. We will learn. Maybe it's the easiest to build. Maybe the other ones need a bit more subtlety and people need to figure out which are the essential cards. However, uh, this graph is uh, sort of prompting me that maybe it is actually that good because I also calculated the number of games for each color pair. And uh, I kept the same order of the win rates. And Gruel is the most played deck apart from being the most winning. And this for me is usually a signal that it's actually good because People drafted the most, at least 17 lens users. That's a very, very important caveat. Uh, I only have the data on playing from 17 lens users. Maybe it's that they do play group because other people don't. Uh, and if that's going to be the case, we're going to see it in Alsa drops for the first couple of days of the cards that are um, uh, key for group. But still, that 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 is a piece of information that is important. It's not underplayed or anything. It's played quite a lot and still wins the most. Uh, second most win, the most played deck is Orzov, which is the third most winning archetype. So again, pretty strong data there. And Boros is the third most played, and um, it's also the uh, uh, second most winning. So top three in terms of play are also top three in terms of winning. And then we have like a pack of decks that include Selesnya, which is, you know, 66% uh, of the play rate that Gruul has. Uh, so Gruul was played 3,000 times, uh, Selesnya roughly 2,000 times. And then the three lowest archetypes are actually drafted quite a lot. So is it Golgari and Demir with the 1,700, 1,900, 1,650? Uh, so they're still played quite a lot, even though they're not winning a lot. And Simic, which, um, which is the fifth most winning archetype, and actually with decent numbers of 57% win rate, um, only 1,000 games, so uh, one third of what uh, Gruul is being played, much less than anything, and actually like roughly half of what, um, well, slightly less than, more than half of what Golgari, for example, is being played. Uh, Azorius is between those played decks and the ones that are not played, 1,500, um, 1,450, and Ragdos is played very, very, very low amounts, and uh, only 680 games for Ragdos such a small number that I actually when I looked at the win rates of cards for each archetype I couldn't do Rakdos because there was just not enough sample size for most of the commons and I decided that's going to be more misleading than informative so uh, 
probably the most important part uh, for you of the information is that people don't play a lot of Rakdos. Okay. So we're going to talk about the, I'm stealing it from protocols, but state of the format, what is it and what's going on compared to predictions. And exactly, I am going to compare what we see from the data with my early prediction, uh, partially to brag, partially to uh, punish myself for being dumb. Um, it's a nice mixture of both. Um, so keep in mind that the, it's still early days, that the data is still shaky. It's a combination of low level of misunderstanding, of understanding the format, and a mix of players that is very specific for the first day's draft, and a mix of uh, some cards being way too open, and that's not going to happen uh, after a week or two. Usually, how a format matures is you have the early two weeks when the format is chaotic and people draft cards that they shouldn't and don't draft the cards that they should. And after two weeks, it sort of stabilizes. And uh, from week two, it's more or less uh, the rate of drafting cards doesn't change by much uh, because also like there may be le less frequent players drop out. So you get more of the people that are invested in limited and they will, they will have a consistent way of drafting things. And uh, also the cards is relatively stable after week two. We are now in day one, so we are in this complete um, weird part of the uh, format because there's big changes in the first couple of days and then slow evolution over the next 10 days or so, and then stable for the rest of the format. We only look at the data from this very, very turbulent time, so yeah, again, keep that in mind. So uh, first, I'm going to talk about the two cuts. Uh, two cuts, um, um, uh, courtesy of uh, Magic, uh, 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 Magic Gathering Data. A Twitter account, two cuts are two color uncommon draft signposts. Um, I like that acronym. Two cuts, I think, is something that should be used more because it's shorter to say if everyone knows what it is. So the first step is spreading the knowledge. So there is, of course, 10 two cuts in the format. And you can see two of them are head and shoulders above anything else. And that's Cinder Clash Ravager, the Gruel one and Bladehold War Whip, uh, the Boros one. Uh, arguably, both of them are in the top two uh, archetypes by the win rate so far. Uh, the win rate of Cinder Clash Ravager, 65.3% of Bladehold War Whip, 64.8. That's a very impressive win rate for an uncommon. Uh, third is Charforger, the black and red, uh, and that's already 59.8. So we have five percentage points different um, uh, between uh, the top two and, and the rest. So in terms of signposts, clear two winners. And then the big pack of Charforger, the black red, uh, Slaughter Singer, the green white, and uh, Cephalopod Sentry, uh, the white uh, blue, um, at around 59%, 50, 50, 60, 59% win rate. Then there's Tainted Observer, the uh, Simic one, um, the 2 3 toxic one. Uh, whenever you play a creature, you can pay an extra couple of mana to proliferate. Um, then we have a uh, void wing hybrid that's the Dimir one at 56.4. And then Vivisection Evangelist, the uh, Ors of one, 56.1%. That's a big data point. I don't know how it's going to evolve over time, but uh, this means that Vivisection Evangelist has a win rate that is lower than the win rate of the archetype, which is at uh, 58.4. Uh, so it's actively bad to play it. Um, and then we have uh, uh, the uh, Serum, Serum Core Chimera, the um, uh, Is It One, and Necrogen Rod Priest at around 55% win rate. Um, the biggest surprise to for me is just by how much better the Ravager and the War Whip are than the rest of them. And uh, how badly does the vivisection evangelist perform? Although, um, although evangelist, it also um, after playing with it a couple of times, I see the problems. 
Ah, so people splash evangelists. That's a good thing to uh, that's a good thing to know. Actually, I have to check it. All decks, white, black, rarity, uncommon. Okay, so Evangelist has a decent 61% uh, win rate in uh, Orzov. And in all decks, in all decks it's lower because it's probably splashed. And I just want to check what is the rate of splashing the card. So it was played 2,300 times in all decks and in white, black. It's been played 1500. So it has a very, very poor win rate uh, outside of Orzov, which makes sense. Um, but actually, the numbers are higher for Orzov only, uh, which makes also sense. Uh, it's still not even in top five uncommons for the archetype. Uh, so uh, be wary of it. I think that there will be decks that are really, really good in playing that. And I had one of those. And um, there are decks that are going to be really poor in playing with that. And uh, most of the time, if you play it as a five mana four for uh, Vigilance, you don't want to do that. OK. Um, Alex Canada, Slaughter Singer is the green white. It also doesn't compete, compute in my head. I, I, I just I cannot connect. Something called Slaughter Singer being a white green thing. I would expect the Slaughter being black and Singer being blue or red. But that's how life is. And um, and that's it. <clears throat> OK, so maybe Vivisection Evangelist is not completely lost. It's just people try to splash it and they shouldn't. Um, so the whole next part is going to be looking at my predictions from last week's app. Well, Actually, not last week's from Monday's episode, and uh, and then uh, looking at how well or how wrong that I got my predictions um, uh, from there, and then discussing why some cards maybe overperform initially, and what questions should we ask ourselves in the next week when we get enough data to actually try to answer them. Um, so these first slide white top commons is what I predicted to be in the top commons uh, slot. And the next slide is going to be what actually is there right now. So uh, someone is asking, conviction is the top common? No, I predicted it to be one of the top commons, and I was wrong. Um, so I predicted Zealot's Conviction, Flensing Raptor, and Planar Disruptions to be in top white commons. Um, planar Disruption is there. Uh, Flensing Raptor is just outside of the top five. Um, and uh, Zealot's Conviction is nowhere to be seen. Um, the actual top white common, uh, according to the data, is Crawling Chorus, the one mana, one one uh, that dies into a one one might uh, at 60.9% win rate in all the white decks. Um, second one is a sort of opposite of it, but somehow similar, a Basilica Shepherd, um, the five mana, three three flyer that makes two mites of the ETB, 60.7. Uh, so those are basically not different from each other. And then we have Indoctrination Attendant, uh, which is uh, the 4 mana 3, 4. You can bounce something to your hand as you play it. And then you create an additional 1, 1 Might. Uh, so basically, all three top cards create 1, 1 Might um, on top of everything. Then we do have the Planar Disruption that I predicted. And in Scissor Glider, uh, the 1, 3 Flyer that with Corrupted uh, pumps all the team when it attacks. Uh, these are the top five commons. I think that it's very important that those might generating uh, creatures are there on top because that's going to show a general trend all through all other colors and all through other, um, all through all the other um, archetypes or color pairs. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not surprised by the chorus. I had it as a very important card in my um, presentation last week. Uh, I'm not surprised by that. Basilica Shepherd, I thought eh, that's a bit um, surprising because especially with the format allegedly being so fast, a five drop being in the top uh, commons is a bit counterintuitive. Same with Indoctrination Attendant. That card is a very, very big uh, overperformer um, so far. It's good in several archetypes. It has very good numbers and uh, um, really impressive for a four mana three two. <coughs> 
And Instant Glider, again, a card that um, I can see its merits. So um, not surprising. Just two mana, one, three flyer is not terrible. And the ability is really strong when you can activate it. So top and commons, I put um, Job on Duelist, Annex Sentry, and Ossification as the top three uh, white and commons uh, in my uh, presentation earlier this week. Uh, what we have, Annex Sentry is clearly the best with 64%. Uh, we have ossification at number two at 62.4 so so far so good then the third one was not job on dualist but bladed ambassador the three one that comes with oil counter and can get indestructible once uh, you know once in this short life but um 62 that's pretty impressive uh hex gold hover wings at 61.5 that card really surprised me i i thought it was good but i didn't expect it to be that good that's the four mana equipment that makes uh, basically at ETB it makes a three to flyer but also pumps your other equipment and um, uh, yeah good numbers for that and and number five is Job on Duelist the, the card I thought will be in top three uh, at 60 percent so slightly off uh, the other um, the other four but Annex Sentry is uh, well head and shoulders above everything else um, and um, yeah I mean I'm quite happy with my prediction I had all three cards that I predicted in top three, that's 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 good enough for me, I guess, uh, for the starters. And two of them were in the top two, which were where I where I thought they will be. Um what can we see here? Um I think that uh, it's a weird combination of two drops, uh evasion and uh, and, and 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 an efficient removal. Uh I wouldn't put too much uh weight on anything particular pattern in there. I want to do just stress that every single white uncommon from those top five says 60 or more percentage uh, percent game and hand win rate, which is quite a lot. Um, top blue commons. I, I predicted mesmerizing, mesmerizing dose to be the top common, and that's the aura, uh, the charm sleep that proliferates. And uh, then I thought bring the ending will be good. Um, the counter spell, the, the, the quench variant that with uh, corrupted becomes just a regular counter spell. And Malkatra's Watcher, the two mana one one flying vigilance that dies into drawing a card. Um, so in reality, the top common is mesmerizing those. So yes, I nailed it at fifty eight percent win rate. Second place is Experimental Augury, a card that I mentioned in the different slide when I when I said uh, like which cards are. Uh, which cards are going to be essential for all the blue archetypes and sort of like gluey kind of cards. Um, Gitaxian Raptor was also on that list for me. Uh, uh, so I'm happy that it's there. Uh, it's number three at 56% win rate. Then we have a Glistener Seer, a card that I knew lots of people were speculating is going to be good, but I somehow ignored it. It seems like it's okay. But also keep in mind that those numbers are pretty low in general. So blue commas don't have like a super high win rate. A uh, Glistener Seer is a one mana O3 that uh, comes with some oil counters and um, taps the scribe. And Malkatra's Watcher, the card that I mentioned, uh, is uh, in number five, just uh, behind the Glistener Seer. Uh, these things are not significantly different from each other. Uh, Bring the Ending is not on the list, and it's actually quite far down. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, I definitely missed on the power of that counter spell uh, so far. Maybe once we start getting the decks that uh, um, uh, that can uh, that can basically utilize uh, a counter spell much better, maybe then we're in the money. Maybe uh, actually bring the ending is a strictly uh, blue black proliferate card and shouldn't be played in other of the blue um, archetypes. And maybe that's the reason. I will have to dig deeper in that data, but uh, I think that sample sizes for that are just slightly too small. Okay. Top and commons. I predicted Tamio Immobilizer um, as uh, the top uncommon in the uh, in blue in general. That's the IC manipulator with oil counters, um, and it's basically just a better IC manipulator. I played against that card several times. I never seen it close to running out of counters somehow. It's always getting more when it needs, and it's just a pain, and it beats you, and you just go, and they don't have to pay mana for it, and it's just awful to play against it. It's a super good card when you have the right deck for that. Um, then 
I picked Anctus Retrofitter, the three mana toxic one. That's the only toxic creature in blue. But I think the toxic is not the most important part of it. Uh, it turns an artifact into a 4 4 when it ETBs until it uh, leaves the battlefield. And I think that, you know, three mana for six, um, six, seven stats, uh, four, four of which is potentially with haste, that's a good deal. Um, so I thought, yeah, that, that card is going to be great. And Troller Drake, uh, the three mana 0 0 flyer that. Uh, enters the battlefield with an oil counter and it gets plus one plus one for each oil counter when you cast a non-creature spell it gets another oil counter i thought that this card can be a house uh, can quickly grow to be some if you don't deal with it like within the first turn it will very quickly become uh too big to handle and uh, i thought that would be good so when we look at the numbers uh number one win rate uh, is tamio as a mobilizer Number two win rate uh, in terms of uncommons in blue is Anctus Retrofitter. And number three is Troller Drake. So nailed it exactly in the same order um, uh, as I predicted. Obviously, the, the, the bit of salt in there is that those numbers are nothing compared to what we had in white. In white, we had 64%, 62% win rate cards. Here we have uh, 58, 57. So uh, they are markedly worse, but at least the uh, uh, prediction was correct. Uh, on top of that, we had the Glistener Seer and Malkatros Watcher as, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, we had uh, Distorted Curiosity, the three mana draw two, and Serum Snare, the cheap bounce spell for two mana that also can proliferate if you bounce something uh, cheap. Uh, but these are at 54%, so I mean, that doesn't look very impressive, does it? Um, so, black top commons. I predicted uh, Blight Belly Rat, Anoint with Affliction, and Offer Immortality. Um, so the 2-2 two, two rat with toxic uh, 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 removal that uh, with corrupted becomes just absolutely amazing, it exiles things uh, um, uh, uh, quite easily. And offer immortality, that was my sort of like a hot takey kind of uh, thing. I assumed it's a combat trick that gives a creature a death touch and indestructible. I assume that it's going to be all about managing board and keeping your creatures in and, and removing creatures of the opponent. And that Toxic gives uh, huge incentives for blocking. And also that Offer Immortality has this hidden combo with the 2-4 Toxic creature with Manus. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's why I sort of gambled, uh, gambled about, um, uh, gambled about um, that particular card. And as you can see, the gamble was not exactly uh, uh, successful. So in terms of black commons so far, um, number one is Anoint with Affliction. Uh, so yes, one one for me. It was in my top three. Number two is Vraska's Fall, albeit with small number sample size, but 58% win rate for Vraska's Fall. That's the three mana ed edict. Um, uh, yeah, it, it overperforms so far at least. No, no, no. That was the, my prediction. It's, it's, it's not there. Um, uh, yeah, Vraska's fall as the number two black common is uh, quite surprising. But just to give you an impression of that, all oh, users color black common. Uh, the Vraska's fall had uh, 1,500 games played, while uh, Anoint with Affliction had around six and a half thousand games played. So there's a big difference in the uh, in the sample size. Um, the fact that, yeah, it gives um, a poison counter is something, and I think that against some decks it's really good, and again, when you're on the play, it's like really strong. Um, I don't know exactly um, how that card plays out because I didn't play it myself, but looking at those numbers, I think I might actually uh, try it out next time and, and see. Uh, I do remember when Iron Golem was a top uncommon, and it might be that. Uh, but also, I know that top um, grinders on um, on Arena are not biggest fans of uh, edict kind of cards, so uh, I don't think that they are jamming Vraska's full in the deck. So uh, I don't know. Uh, Vraska's full is it on instant speed? Yes, it is on the instant speed. Yeah. Um, pom, 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 pom. It's a great response to um, to some cards. Uh, Blackberry Rat is uh, number three with, oh, again, much bigger sample size than Braska's Fold. So that's one of my top three cards. I'm happy that it was in top three. Then a big surprise for me, but I also see the merit of the card. 
a stinging hive master that's the three mana three two that dies into a one one might um i think the card is pretty decent and it confirms the same thing that we sort of saw in white commons that those things that generate mites for free when 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 they die or when they enter the battlefield and they sort of give this free boost to keeping your board wider are overperforming so far and this is something that i think uh, is worth knowing while the things that require extra mana spending to keep your board state um, and board presence uh, up, like the card that I speculated would be one of the top commons offer immortality, they underperform compared to what I thought maybe they would do because you need to pay mana for them. While Stinging Hive Master does that same kind of thing for free. Um, and the fact that you don't have to pay mana means that you can invest in something else. So early doors but maybe it's not exactly the combat trick format that i thought it might be uh maybe it's just okay i'll have my two for one creatures instead of that um <clears throat> and the last uh, card that we have on that list is the um cruel grimnark that's the six mana death touch uh, five five when it enters the battlefield each uh, opponent discards a card and those who if, if they can't you gain four life um this one is just keyword big i played against it a couple of times and it was just like well i guess i have to double block it to kill it and all of my stuff is going to be killed by that and um i was not very happy about it and also it already got uh, nabbed the card from my hand when et beat so yeah maybe big things are just good because it's hard to deal with them like a red deck will not often have uh, cards that can deal with um, with the five five as a removal, and um, and it's going to be a problem for them because it does have death touch, so it will trade with anything. Uh, yeah. In terms of top uncommons, my speculation again, this is my speculations was. Uh, uh I, I i put actually the bilious skull dweller as a top uh black and common the one one death touch with toxic one uh i was i thought a bit of a, a, a bit of a hot takey gamble then i put ambulatory edifice that card is a house um three mana for a three two uh when it enters the battlefield you may pay two life and when you do target creature gets minus one minus one until end of turn um and drown in Iker, uh, that's uh, two mana, target creature gets minus four, minus four until end of turn, and proliferate at sorcerer's speed, like a great removal on raid. When we look at the numbers, I win. Bilius Skull Dweller is the top black uncommon at 61.1% uh, win rate. The 1 1 rat that could. Um, then we have Nimraiser Paladin, and that is uh, just to read the card uh, perfectly. A card that um, um, I completely missed during the previous season in terms of like, I knew that it exists, but I didn't think it's going to be great or anything. It's a five mana four, four with toxic two. And when it and enters the battlefield, return target creature card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to your hand. Now, the fact that it returns to your hand, I thought hmm, that's just maybe not that good, but it is pretty strong and I will not ignore that card ever again um, um, the numbers in are pretty solid even if it drops by a percentage point here and there uh, uh, I am I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy about playing it I think I played also against it and it was a bit back breaking I think that again in this format board presence is so important that being able to play a creature and keep up the board presence at the same time um is amazing uh ambulatory edifice i had an amazing experience with this card i mean it does so much um it, there's always some x1 to kill and if not then you just attack they block and then after the uh, combat you can finish off something bigger or sometimes it just jammed it as a three two when there was or, you know in the in the board state when we already ran out of resources and then ambulatory edifice is the last thing standing the three two is okay in that stage of the game because uh, they need to top deck something to deal with it. Um, Drown and Iker is fourth. So I didn't get all the top three cards, but those numbers are so close. They're all around 59%. Uh, 
I'm going to give myself that it was a good prediction, especially that black and commons in terms of win rates drop off quite steeply after the top four. So those four are just so much better than everything else. And then number five, VAT emergence is at 55.5%. And I don't think that's good numbers or anything compared to the rest of the black card. I think that black's problem is not having amazing um, uncommons apart from the fourth dimension. Red, top commons. So my predictions were hex gold slash, saw blade scamp and vault charge. Uh, which I thought was a relatively safe prediction. I thought Hogs Hex Gold Slash is amazing. Soblade Scamp, I had so many plans with that card. And Volt Charge, um, yeah, it's just um, a very good on right card. Uh, when I look at the top five cards, uh, out of the three that I picked, Volt Charge barely made it to the, um, uh, to the list of the top five. Number one, common and in red and in any other color, uh, Chimney Rebel. 61.6% um, win rate. That's the 3-3 three, three with haste that makes a 1-1. One, one. And that card just shows you how one little keyword can change uh, um, an evaluation. Because we had lots of those 4-mana 3-3s three, that make a 1-1. One, one, but the haste, well, the haste just basically makes it cheaper by one turn. Because you attack it on the same turn as you play it. So it's as if you played a normal creature like that on turn 3, basically. Uh, okay, the one one cannot attack, but you know, almost almost one mana trimmed off from the cost, and, um, and that makes it into an amazing card. Um, then second place we have Axiom Engraver, and Axiom Engraver is um, um, the one three um, that uh, comes with uh, some oil counters, two oil counters, and you can tap it without paying any mana. Tap it, remove an oil counter, and you just uh, rummage. Uh, that card, uh, I had really good experience with it so far, and numbers also pointed out. The 1-3 body is pretty good uh, in this format because it does block quite um, a number of important creatures, uh, while later in the game it can actually generate your card advantage by dumping stuff that you don't need for stuff that you might want to need. Um, number three is Furnace Strider. That's the 5-mana 4-5 um, that comes with two oil counters, and it can give uh, something haste by removing one of those oil counters. Most of the time it gives haste to itself, and then that you still have one oil counter left that you may or may not proliferate at some stage. <coughs> so, um, and again, those oil counters turn into uh, mana because by attacking on turn um, on turn five, when you play it, it sort of becomes a four drop um, uh, at four or five, which is a good rate, and you still have that one oil counter left over. So, yeah. Um, Number four is Barbed Batter Fist. That's the uh, uh, plus one, minus one equipment with four Mirrodin. Um, so basically, it's a three one that leaves the equipment behind. And Volt Charge is uh, number five at 58.9. Um, so only one card of my list made it into the uh, top five. Uh, none of them made in top three. Hex Gold Slash, just for your information, was just behind... Um, uh, a volt charge by 0.1, so that's the percentage point. So there's like absolutely no different. Um, but Sawblade Scalp Scald is uh, still at a credible 57%, but uh, some way behind those cards that I mentioned. Um, again, I'm not saying I'm not saying it might not move up in the future. So uh, it would be good to also revisit that list at the end of the format and maybe look at the um, stats from after week one. Uh, how does it change and how does it shape? Uh, pop, 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 pop. Okay. Uh, top and commons, this is my predictions. I predicted Churning Reservoir, the one mana artifact. That was my sort of gambly kind of guess that this card is going to be busted. Um, the one mana artifact, and uh, you put uh, an oil counter at the beginning of your upkeep on a non token uh, artifact of creature you control, and you can tap it. Uh, for two mana and tap, it creates a 1-1 one, one goblin, uh, but you can only activate the ability when you used up oil that turn or if a creature with oil uh, went to graveyard uh, on your side, um, which is actually quite often that you can use it. Um, so I assume that this might be actually pretty decent glue card for the oil decks uh, and put it on my list of top uncommons. Then Rebel Salvo, that's not really a surprise, the three mana removal that deals five damage and can actually cost two to two one mana because there's affinity for equipment for some 
some reason, I guess. Um, that card is just a great monster. And then I put Furnace Punisher, the three mana, three, three menace uh, that has a text that will rarely work at the beginning of each up player's upkeep. Furnace Punisher deals two damage to that player unless they control two or more basic lands. I've been pinged by it already. Um, so these were my three uncommons that I predicted. And when we look at the list, uh, uh, Rebel Salvo is number one at 63.8%. Uh, card is good, as I predicted. Um, then, but number two is Hex Gold Halberd, the two mana for Mirrodin uh, equipment that gives first strike and trample on your turn to the creature that it equips. 63.6, um, so really good. Both of those two mana uh, for Mirrodin red uh, equipments high on the list of commons and uncommons, respectively. Then there's Exuberant Fuse Link, the one one with trample that grows uh, uh, in oil counters for uh, every creature or artifact that leaves, um, that goes to graveyard on your side. Uh, I've been attacked by this being an 8 1, and it was painful, and I felt sad. Um, and I lost that game also. So uh, that thing can do some heavy lifting if your deck is slightly tuned towards playing it. Uh, then we have Resistance Skyward, and that was a big surprise for me. That's just a 5-5 five, five, uh, Menace Reach uh, for 5 mana. And it has good stats. I mean, I know that 5 mana, 5-5 five, five for 5 mana is okay. But I also see that this format is sort of like promoting either big things for 5 mana or 2 drops. And there's not much in between. So um, I guess... You know, like, it, again, early data, but I guess having this sort of U-shaped uh, mana curve when you have two drops and six drops uh, is maybe the strategy to play, uh, he asked. And luckily for me, Churning Reservoir made number five, although it's significantly lower than anything else on that list. But that means that two of my three cards made it to the top five. Uh, Churning Reservoir ran 58%, so like five percentage points lower than the Rebel Salvo, but still made top five, so that's that's uh, I'm happy with that. Uh, Card the key says, uh, why is the Sky Warden an ogre and not an ape? I think that this is the art problem. Uh, I know that the card is a reference to some previous uh, uh, to some previous uh, card from like ages ago when the ogre was wild and now it's civilized and fighting for Mirrodin. So uh, uh, there is some kind of reference to an older card on it that was an ogre, and that's why it's an ogre. Um, and question from chat about the Fortu that pink stuff when it comes in. Uh, this card is uh, a different card, and that is Urabrask's Anointer. This one was... Um, just uh, behind the top five. It was number seven, but uh, just very small difference. The card that I picked, put in my top three, Furnace Punisher, was number six, so just outside of the of the list that I was showing, um, with uh, like 57% win rate. Green common. Green commons. Okay. Um, I picked Ruthless Predation. That's the two mana um, fight spell that gives plus one, plus two. Uh, Contagious Vorak, the three mana three three that draws a land or proliferates. Which, you know, I mean that was not like a. I'm I'm not proud that I got it right. Uh, spoiler alert, because I mean that was obvious that this card is busted, and uh, I picked Tyrannic's Atrocity, the five mana four four haste with Toxic three, because I thought that the surprising Toxic three might be, uh, might be something that is important. Um, let's look at the actual numbers. Vorak is number one, yay, 61.5% uh, win rate. Um, number two is Oil Gorger Troll, uh, the five mana three, four, gain three life, and if you have something with oil, um, it becomes, uh, you draw a card. And uh, I knew the card is gonna be decent, but I was expecting it somewhere like, you know, top five. And it's so far, it's in, uh, in second place, although, um, the win rate level of green things is pretty flat and actually pretty high as well. So 61.5% win rate for the Vorak, 60.7 uh, for the Oil Gorger Troll. Um, number three is the Lattice Blade Mantis, the 4-3 that comes with two oil counters. Um, and if you attack, you can remove one uh, to give it plus one, plus one and sort of vigilance until end of turn. 
Um, that's 60.3. That's quite impressive. I definitely wouldn't put that card uh, as high before the format. And obviously, I didn't. So, uh, yeah. Then we have the Rustvine Cultivator. Um, and that is uh, uh, the one mana, uh, mana dork, sort of. Uh, it's a one, two. You can tap it to put an oil counter on it. And you can tap it to remove an oil counter from it and untap target land. This has like some cute synergies because a it uh, it it sort of ramps you to things, but also uh, the fact that you can put uh, counters on it at will um, uh, is useful as a maybe sometimes uh, ability to activate this Urabrusk's Anointer extra ping um, uh, when you when you need it. Um, and um, number five is ruthless predation. So I got two of my top three in the top five. Um, the, the Tyrannix uh, atrocity is nowhere to be seen in the top five. But uh, in, 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 in all fairness, it's it's number six on the list, so not, not that far. Uh, the question remains how easy it is to say three commons and having them in top six, probably much easier than having them in top three. Uh, OK, uncommons. Um, I picked Armored Scrap Gorger, uh, the two mana O3. Uh, that gets plus three plus oh, as long as it has three or more all, all counters on it, and it taps for mana of any color. And whenever it taps, you may exile a card from a graveyard. And if you do, you put an oil counter on it. So basically, if there's stuff in um, uh, in the graveyard, um, you can basically uh, exile it, and 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 eventually it will become a three three which is a great rate. I thought that this card allows you to ramp, allows you to splash, allows you to uh, have a mana drug that becomes a relevant body in the late game when its mana darkness has been um, um, outlived. So I thought, yeah, that might be a, a good uncommon. Second one that I decided to put on my, on my top three list before the set was released is Evolving Adaptive. That's a one mana oh, oh. Uh, It enters with the oil counter, which is a sort of plus one, plus one counter. And whenever another creature enters the battlefield with uh, uh, under your control with a bit higher toughness or uh, um, or power than it, uh, it gets another counter. I actually found it that um, in red green, evolving adaptive is a neat combo with the um, uh, with the equipment that gives plus plus one minus one because it lowers the toughness of the adaptive, which means that it can get an extra counter from something. Uh, um, uh, when normally it wouldn't have done. So that's uh, maybe a neat combo that you can look for uh, when you're playing that card. Um, so I thought this is going to be super strong. And I put Viral Spawning, the three mana sorcery that makes a 3-3 three, three beast with Toxic 1. And when you get corrupted, you can uh, cast it from the graveyard as well. So these are my three picks. Uh, when we look at the uh, actual data, Evolving Adaptive is the top green uncommon with 64% win rate. Uh, so I nailed this particular one. Then number two is, uh, I knew the card is OK. I didn't think it's that good. And it's weird because I was super high on uh, on the uh, uh, green make an XX uh, from uh, Brothers War. And this one, I said, oh, but it only makes three threes. Well, it turns out making three threes is enough. And that's the incubation sack. It comes with um, uh, three oil counters. And you can pay four mana and tap it to make th three threes. So it's like a mini hill giant factory. Um, uh, yeah, it overperformed my expectations definitely at 64 ish percent win rate. Then we have Silvok Battle Chair, uh, the six mana equipment with four Mirrodin that um, makes a six six trampler. Um, again, we see those one drop, a mana sink for late game, a six drop. And then we, on number four, we have uh, Canker Bloom, the two mana three two that can sack to destroy artifact enchantment or proliferate. And number five is Armored Scrap Gorger, the card that I put in my top three at the O3 for two mana. So again, we see this U shape kind of tendency that we have very cheap cards and very expensive cards um, uh, as the top uh, top cards in, in, in each color. Um, did we have the same here? Well, sort of. We had the cheap cultivator and ruthless predation and expensive oil gorger troll. Rock and lattice blade mantis are sort of in the mid range in terms of common. Uh, is the sample size on the chair pretty small? 
is the chair small sample size? Let's look at it. I mean, obviously, all those uh, sample size are uh, small. It's 1,700 games played, and uh, it's been in the hand uh, 630 times. So not huge, but it's not small. It still can be linked to a very strong combination of um, uh, red green decks. Uh, so that might be that might be the case for it. But it's not like it's not like minute. You can you can get something out of. At least second slide is going to be um, what actually um, key for blaster Derm didn't make the list because it's a rare. Um, I don't talk about rares because the numbers uh, are, are too small. Um, so these are the three cards that I predicted to be key commons for the uh, white blue archetype. And I put uh, Mesmering Dose, uh, the Charm Sleep. I put uh, Meldweb Spider, Strider, the five mana, five, five uh, vehicle that comes with an oil counter and um, um, and um, uh, you can basically remove oil counter to make it into a creature. So if you play it and you don't have to use it on turn one, maybe you can proliferate and it sort of becomes like a free vehicle uh, with your proliferate kind of combination, but it's also an artifact. So I thought maybe it's going to be key in the white blue because I thought mm, maybe it needs big things. And Mandible Justicia, uh, uh, two mana, two one with lifelink. That is an artifact creature. And whenever artifact enters the battlefield, um, it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Um, so, uh, by far mesmerizing those is the top, uh, common in, uh, white blue with 62.7% win rate. That's a lot. Uh, second place is indoctrination attendant. Um, wait a second. I need to, I need to help myself a bit with the reading cards because I don't want to just, um, tell you something that is not true. But uh, that's the four mana, uh, three, four, that makes a one, one might with toxic one um, when you bounce something to your hand. Um, again, this card overperforming in every single archetype it's in. Even in white, blue, toxic doesn't make that much of a difference, but you know, the might that it creates is an artifact. Um, so yeah, maybe that's the reason. 61% win rate roughly for that. Then we have planar disruption, surgical bay, and mandible justicia at 59. Uh, importantly, mandible justicia has a very poor win rate um, in every single archetype, apart from the white blue. So I think that this card is just specific white blue artifact um, um, uh, artifact synergy kind of card. And yes, you can uh, you can pick up an artifact. So again, I got two of my top three in the top five, uh, which is not uh, terrible, but not great. Um, I think that this is a cute thing that Surgical Bay, the blue uh, land, is in this top five. Um, but also, I mean, I don't know how much I can weight I can put on that thing because uh, the actual white land is not so high. So I don't know. Is it has to be particularly blue? Do the decks have to be? more blue heavy than white heavy uh, to be successful i don't know um but this is also like shows you that again small sample sizes um white black i put my key commons as the crawling chorus flensing raptor and anoint with affliction i thought you know one drop is important to get corrupted online very quickly flensing raptor is giving evasion that allows to push uh, uh push those toxic damage so you can get to corrupted and once you get corrupted, anoint with affliction is just busted because um, yeah, it's a two mana exile anything. Um, let's see what was there. Uh, so top common white black is crawling chorus at sixty five point one percent win rate, a lot. Um, but it's just like basically even with the basilica shepherd, uh, the five mana three three that makes two mites uh, at sixty five. These two cards just head and shoulders above anything else in uh, white black. Um, then number three is Anoint with Affliction, um, as another card that I predicted, 63.5. Again, really strong numbers there. Uh, uh, and that sort of, sort of points you to what are the essential cards for the archetype. Then Stinging Hive Master, the 3-2 that dies into a 1-1 Might. 
and uh, Blight Belly Rat, the two mana, two, two with um, uh, Toxic One, and if it dies, uh, it proliferates. So I got two out of three. Again, we see the same pattern of uh, one drop, very important. Making multiple bodies in the late game, very important. Uh, making bodies for free very important, and that proliferate in the Blight Belly Rat turns out is makes it better than the uh, than the two two with first strike, which which was slightly surprising for me. Um, uh, although, no, actually the the two two with the with first strike is quite quite lower than the rest, but it still has like sixty percent win rate. But for me, it seems like there in white black there is maybe like. 10 to 12 cars that are exceptional in that archetype and a bunch of cars that just are not and uh, and you have to know which ones you want to play uh so you probably want to play charge of the mites is fine planar disruption is great flensing raptor complete devotion the, the plus two plus two combat trick is is pretty good uh vraska's fall actually has good numbers of small small uh small sample size but in that archetype and then the 2-2 two, two with first strike and indoctrination attendant are all good. And then it starts to uh, drop off um, uh, uh, a bit steeper. Uh, in terms of white red, key commons I selected was uh, Hex Cold Slash, Barb Butterfist, and Chimney Rabble. Uh, Hex Cold Slash, the shock variant, Barb Butterfist, the free one equ equipment uh, with for Mirrodin. And a chimney rubble, the four mana three three haste that makes a one one. Okay, I'm I'm seem to be back. I'm sorry, I, we had some uh, electricity problems in the area uh, today, and maybe that's that's what uh, is trying to glitch me. But I'm hopefully back. So uh, I'll start the key commons in white red. Uh, actually, the top winning common is the Mirren Bardiche, the uh, for Mirren equipment that makes a four three vigilant creature. But this one has a particularly um, particularly small sample size. So it's worth uh, keeping in mind that it has a good numbers. But, um, but uh, don't sleep on it. Just um, make sure that um, uh, you test it at least for yourself. Uh, I think it's worth testing. Number two is indoctrination attendant, making two bodies still good. Um, in equipment decks, so uh, yeah. Also, arguably, indoctrination attendant can bounce back uh, one of those for Mirrodin uh, equipments, and you can replay it to make another two-two. So, sort of gives you the extra uh, abilities. Um, then there's Barb Butterfist, the uh, three-one equipment, uh, and then Chimney Rabble and Axiom Engraver, the one-three that can um, uh, ramage. So. Actually, out of my three cards that I selected, the two that I was least sure of, the Bar Butterfist and Chimney Rebel, made the list, but Hex Cold Slash is not on that list. And I quickly look. It is obviously sixth, uh, with still decent 60% win rate, so I'm not crying about my predictions at all, but um, it's not in the top um, five. Then you still have Basilica Shepherd and Planar Disruptions. And yet again, uh, the picture that emerges is that making multiple bodies or multiple pieces of cardboard on the board is more important than uh, a pure removal uh, in this form. Um, okay. White green, the key commons. Uh, I picked Vorak because that card is strong. Uh, I put in Scissor Glider, uh, the one three with flying that gets corrupted because I thought, okay, this deck might want to actually get corrupted and kill with actual damage. Um, and Mace Skullbum, that was my sort of like a gamble on, uh... oh, hey, Jamie, thanks for the raid. Um, I'm in the middle of uh, looking at the first data for the, um, for the set and, and, and we're going through the archetypes and which cards are winning the most. Um, okay. So these were my types before the set was released. Uh, this is the actual numbers. Lattice Blade Mantis, 63% win rate, by far the most winning ES card in the white green. Uh, that was pretty surprising for me when I saw that number. And um, and it's also like mm, not a particularly huge sample size, but not a particularly small one either. So that's 700 games played with that card. 
Um, I mean, I know the card is good, but I was expecting more that is going to be good in, say, I don't know, red oil deck uh, and not in the white green. But it seems to be good in the white green. Uh, number two is Contagious Vorak. So I got this one correct. Um, uh, 61.5, roughly. Um, card is still good, just on rate. Uh, but mind you, top two white green commons, none of them has Toxic. Number three in Scissor Glider. Uh, so uh, yeah, I got it. I got this one. Uh, 61.3, so slightly lower than Contagious Vorak, which means that some Toxic will be played, but probably uh, uh, it's actually you want to focus on getting Corrupted rather than killing with Toxic Damage. Um, and then Flensing Raptor, all these three cards, Vorak, Glider, and Flensing Raptor are roughly the similar you know, uh, range of 61.453. Um, Flensing Raptor, again, the card that will very usefully... Um, Generate some toxic to uh, to turn on your payoffs for um, for corrupted uh, and number five ruthless predation. So no, unfortunately, skull bomb was too much of a gamble. Uh, I tried to be too hot takey. It's nowhere near the top five. Uh, it's actually oh, I have to scroll very far. I have to scroll very very far. Oh, I still I'm still scrolling. Yes, it's actually, uh, of the cards that were played, the lowest win rate card in white green. So well done me, I um, I completely missed on the Skull Bombs. But to be fair, people are high on Skull Bombs in general. Um, I think I was like a bit lower than, uh, than than the average, except for the Mace Skull Bomb, which I tried to you know showcase as a potential way of pushing uh, uh, the um, toxic damage through. But they all underperform, and I would say, yeah, be careful about playing those uh, spell bombs. Uh, for me, the sign is that if the skull bombs are not in the top uh, commons in uh, artifact deck, then there is something odd with them. Okay, white green. So yeah, again, two out of three made it into top three that I picked, but so I'm quite happy. But I'm quite unhappy that one of them was uh, absolutely uh, a complete miss. And then that's the problem with hot takes. When you take hot takes, you want to take a risky opinion uh, because it was obvious it wouldn't be a hot take. And when you take risky opinions, you know, you get three of them right and people think that you're some kind of a prophet, but most of the time it's just flukes. Um, okay, blue, black, key commons. I picked uh, experimental augury. Uh, so the sort of like uh, look at the top three, draw one of them and proliferate. Um, because blue black has some key proliferate synergies. Then I picked a two four uh, with minus and toxic two, and whisper of the draws the one mana target creature gets minus one minus one, and then you proliferate because again it's like a cheap removal that can target something or make make you win a combat, but also proliferates, which is useful for some of your payoffs. The reality, top card, Blight Belly Rat, 58.4. Uh, then Anoint with Affliction, um, the removal, Malkata's Watcher, the 1 1 Flying Vigilance that dies into a drawing card, Glistening Seer, the 0 3 4 1 mana uh, that, um, um, that can tap for Scry, and Experimental Augury, uh, that's the uh, uh, only card from my top three that I actually got right. Uh, and it's the lowest one of them all. They are at around 58 to 57 percent win rate. Uh, but two drop, two drop, two drop, one drop, two drop. Uh, I think that this is the main part of that story. Uh, blue black seems like it performs better with those low uh, uh, low casting cost uh, spells. I can look at a bit of uh, you know broader picture of that uh, of those numbers. Uh, bring the ending is just after that. Uh, the counter spell, the, the quench variant. Surgical skull bomb after that. So another one drop. Gitaxian raptor, three drop. Uh, and then Melville curator, the four mana three, four that can return a spell on the top of your uh, on the top of your library from the graveyard. And interestingly, just the uh, pretty low mesmeric dose which does so well in other archetypes here it has lower numbers i don't know why um again blue black was not played by a whole uh, was not played a whole bunch so um 
some of those are uh, pretty small sample sizes, like Malkatras Watcher and Glistening Seer, quite small sample sizes. But I think Glistening Seer shows pretty good numbers, and I think that this is the card that you should not sleep on. Uh, Blue-Red, I put Experimental Augury, which we talked about just a second ago. Icor Synthesizer, a card that we didn't met, manage to mention yet, but it's a two mana, one, three. Uh, whenever you cast an creature spell, gets an oil counter, and whenever you have uh, four oil counters, it becomes a three, three unblockable creature. So this is a card I dedicated quite a large chunk of my previous episode. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it looks like a particularly good card for blue-red. Uh, and Sawblade Scamp, the one one with haste, whenever you cast an old creature spell, it gets an old counter and you can tap it to ping. Uh, I found that this card deal dealt quite a lot of damage in my uh, early decks and I, in my uh, pre-release deck, and that's why I decided to put it on my list of top commons. Uh, what we get is that the top card for that archetype was Barb Butterfist, the free one equipment. Makes sense. It's a non creature spell that is a creature, which is great for that archetype because it can enable synergies while still allowing you to be on board. Axiom Engraver, one, three, that um, ramages. Number two. Uh, number three is Ecor Synthesizer, the card that I talked about, um, uh, the one, the another one, three. Then we have Furnace Strider, the five mana, four, five, that gets haste. And Experimental Augury, um, uh, the, uh, look at three, draw one, and peripherate. Again, two drop, two drop, two drop, five drop, two drop. We again see this kind of U-shaped um, uh, uh, thing. Mind that, uh, yeah, top is 59% win rate and bottom is 56% win rate. So quite a large amplitude between the top five, but also not particularly high numbers compared to, uh, let's say, uh, white green when every common in top five was over 60% or uh, white red when there was the same case, or white black when it was even higher, there was like 65 for top commons. So uh, keep in mind, this these are much lower numbers comparable with the Demir and and actually makes sense from the perspective of uh, those decks are among the low winning rate. Oh, my throat this is at the end, but also this presentation is at the end. Um, Blue green. This one is the highest win rate blue uh, archetype. My speculation. There was a bit of uh, a bit of hot takeism there and a bit of uh, uh, assumption. I thought experimental augury is going to be good because that archetype looks like it wants to proliferate. Um, I put old Gor oil gorger troll because I thought okay, there is plenty of oil synergy in blue and green. Uh, and this is sort of like a card that brings you back in the game because it gains you those three life and puts like a sizable body on board. And my hot take was the Vivisurgence inside the five mana draw three and proliferate because again, synergy was proliferate. I thought maybe it will be better there than uh, uh, maybe it will be better than uh, than in other archetypes and maybe actually playable. So I put it as a sort of hot take. Uh, top five cards. Uh, number one, Gitaxian Raptor. 66.4% win rate in that archetype. Uh, turns out that coming into battlefield with some oil counters already is good when you want to proliferate a bit. So uh, uh, Gitaxian Raptor is pretty uh, pretty strong in that archetype. Um, do, 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 uh, just to look at the sample size for that, it is only 640 games. So keep that those numbers are really, really on the edge of being... Uh, uh, on the edge of being uh, significant in any way. So please refrain with calling Gitaxian Raptor insane. It's probably solid in this archetype, but this has quite large error bars uh, uh, attached. Uh, number two, uh, Mesmeric Dose, the Charmed Sleep, 63% win rate. It also proliferates, which is maybe something that this deck wants to do. I didn't put it on my list because why would I? Old Gorgia Troll, that one I got, um, 62.5. Um, Ruthless Predation, the fight spell, 61.2. I guess makes sense. That's a very few, uh, that's a very few uh, removal spells in blue, green. And both of them actually make the list. Uh, so weirdly, blue and green are the colors where uh, removal is making the top five list and red uh, is not necessarily one of them. And then there's the Surgical Bay, the... Uh, 
uh, the sphere land, uh, completing the list. At a credible 59.8, we have Hunter's Maze next to it. So this archetype really looks like it does like those spheres. So it wants to lead to a longer game and in this long game can gain card advantage on the cost of mana that it doesn't need anymore. Uh, so yeah, and other cards that are still these that are close to that will be Icor Synthesizer, Lattice Blade Mantis, and Experimental Augury is just far behind uh, at 58% win rate. Uh, so arguably quite away from the top five, but still a decent number. So uh, I don't feel super sad about uh, missing on top three. While the uh, Vivisectionist insight is, and I'm still scrolling, and I'm still scrolling, and I'm still scrolling. Hopefully I will be saved by the fact that it just doesn't have a large enough sample size. Yes, I'm saved by the fact that it doesn't have big enough uh, sample size. So probably it's busted and it will be in top three, it's just that there is not enough uh, sample to talk about it. But keep in mind again, uh, Blue Green had a very small sample size and because of that, those numbers are dodgy yet. We can talk about them in a week and then maybe we'll get enough. Um, which card, I assume that the which card I was talking about that I missed, uh, uh, where am I? Vivi, Vivi Surgeon's Insight. Uh, I, I, I speculate that it's going to be a top three common, but it's not, doesn't have a large enough sample size to actually get a win rate number. So I, I can't know if I was right or not. We will assume that it's busted, uh, because I said it was busted before the format. So obviously it has to be right for me to feel good about myself. Um, pa -pa -pum. I skip black red because it didn't have enough sample size. Uh, so we move straight to black green. Uh, I picked uh, cards that want to do toxic and are cheap and branch blight stalker and pestilent siphoner and offer immortality to push that damage through and make my creatures survive and be able to deal that mm, toxic damage. Top card, Anoint with Affliction. I mean, I should have known that, but I was just like, I, I was trying to make fancy picks rather than the obvious ones. Number two, Contagious Vorak. Um, number three, Pestilent Siphoner. Got it. Uh, so at least I got one of the top three, of my top three and the actual top three. Uh, then we have Testament Bearer. Uh, so Testament Bearer, not to mix up, is uh, the four mana four one that dies into an organ hoarder ability uh and dune mover at 56 percent uh, that's the uh, mirror that uh, can put a land on top of the library suggesting that there might be some splashing going around but yeah golgari does not have good numbers um which makes the number for anoint the affliction even more impressive the 61 percent win rate of that card and also it I don't know. I don't. I don't think that this deck has a good like personality. We still need to maybe work harder to try to figure out how to build it properly. Uh, um, but if you do, Vorak and Anoint with Affliction seem like a good ways of starting where to build it. I'm happy that the Pestilent si Siphoner uh, made it into top three in this archetype because uh, that card did not go in top three in anything else. So the fact that I assume that it might be good in this one uh, makes me feel okay about myself in terms of predicting a uh, card this niche for one single archetype. Do, 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 do. Um, so uh, Razupalt uh, says, uh, when my opponents were Golgari, there were because of bombs and they crushed me. I played against the Golgari deck yesterday and they Curved out with the Pestilent Siphoner. Then they, on turn three, they played the 4 4 with Toxic One and Trample and Proliferates on Connect. And I was already like, ooh, that's going to be problematic. Um, and then on turn four, they just casually dropped Children. And that was more or less the game for me. So, yeah, I mean, I, I see what you're coming from, where you're coming from. Um, by the way, that's an important piece of data that I tried to analyze uh, but didn't make a slide. Uh, didn't make a slide about it. The uh, 
traitors from other sets are opened at around 60% rate of normal mythics. So they are slightly rarer than their actual mythics, uh, but they are not like super, super rare. So you're going to see them. Get ready for Vorinclexing. Um, okay, let's move further. Uh, our last but not least, actually quite the contrary. The um, most archetype is the red-green. My prediction of the key commons was uh, Contagious Vorak. This time I went definitely, um, uh, I went definitely for uh, for the powerful card. Uh, then I picked Koldrotha Cackler, the uh, three mana two three with Trample, and when it attacks, it gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is the number of permanents you control with oil. Um, uh, it's a two three I mentioned, hopefully. And then uh, Axiom Engraver, the one three that ravages. I thought that this card is good because it comes with oil early, and then uh, it can help you uh, find whatever solution you need to find in this deck that normally doesn't have too much access to card draw. Um, numbers, number one, Contagious Vorak, nailed it. Um, uh, number at 65% win rate, which is like super impressive. Number two, Chimney Rabble, uh, uh again, the big overperformer so far of the format, uh, at 65. So just, uh, under the Contagious Vorak. Number three, Axiom Engraver, 64.4. So, uh, two out of three for this one. Uh, then Hex Gold Slash at 64, and then Terramorphic Expanse at 63.8. Um, I have no explanation why Terramorphic Expanse is so good in this particular archetype, uh, but all those cards have a super high win rate. Uh, maybe it's just that people that build responsible mana bases win more, and uh, they sort of increase the win rate of the Terramorphic Expanse. Um, interestingly, number six would be Free From Flesh, the plus two, plus two combat trick that... Um, uh, also puts two oil counters on something. And um, Furnace Strider just behind that, Rasvine Cultivator, Lattice Blade Mantis, all these cards have really strong numbers. Volt Charge, Ruthless Predation, Oil Gorger Troll, these cards all have over 60% win rate. So um, that's the sort of core of the oil deck, I think. Okay. Da, 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 da. That's it. Amazing. Well, I mean, that's not it. I still have to acknowledge all the help that I'm getting um, uh, in running this um, stream slash podcast slash YouTube. I'm now a professional YouTuber. I, I finally uh, switched on monetization of me, which, by the way, means you can uh, uh, you can you, you you can skip those ads. Don't worry. But let, tell me if there's something if there's something annoying about the ads on my YouTube because I don't know how to run them. Uh, tell me what is annoying and I will try to figure out how to change it so that it's actually uh, pleasant. I want them to run because obviously I want my two pounds, but um, uh, but uh, I also want to make it pleasant for people to watch rather than having to go through all the uh, painful commercials because I know some people put them every two minutes and it's unwatchable. Um, link to YouTube. Uh, uh, it should be on my Twitch, you know, is it, isn't it? Is it? Is it? It's YouTube slash Sherkovic. Uh, it's very easy. Um, I don't have it. Oh wow! I I I I, I better I, I better I better I better do it. Yes, Man Moses, I sold out for uh, uh, for for this massive YouTube money. But my acknowledgments. I mean, obviously, none of my activity would be possible without um, uh, Seventeen Lens. Uh, I say uh, before you monetize me, uh, go to Seventeen Lens and monetize them. And then you can come back to me if you still have any leftovers. Um, so viral misnomer, uh, uh, congrats uh, to him uh, on uh, being awesome and uh, uh, yeah, uh, helping with uh, everything and, and running everything. So thanks to him. Hululu, Grant Wu, Ale Ballini. Uh, there is a new addition to the uh, 17 Lens team that is still didn't make it onto the slides, but Johnny DWSC is helping with... Uh, marketing and something um uh, do i have to say fake jake brown am i legally obliged to say that uh, uh, um that fake jake brown is an important part of this because uh, he dedicates his minimal free time into making this podcast much more listenable than the actual live stream did i
Is it with E at the end? Well, there you go. Uh, by the way, Feng Jake Brown is also known as Uncle Cardboard. So uh, they are the same person. Yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, thanks to him. I mean, he's really doing heavy lifting to make this release as a podcast. I don't know if I would be able to do it on my own and definitely not as well as um, as it actually is released because Uncle Cardboard, he's the person. He's the person that can convert your uh, mediocre MP3 into something that sounds half decent. So yeah, uh, there you go. And of course, uh, mtgazone.com, who is sponsoring my stream, uh, if I write an article, so sort of sort of sponsoring. Uh, but also, um, that keeps me uh, active and, and thinking about uh, stuff to write, and also keeps me thinking about how to structure my episodes so that I can actually write something. Um, and, um, and yeah, and there's still Assesku and Mana Junkie, the two people that created the music I use in the podcast version of it. So, uh, yeah, with that, I'll see you next week.